the saint, the philosopher, the guide, the pioneer, and the real architect of the new Trinidad and Tobago. And the sterling contribution which he has made to the development of this country, to the Caribbean, and to the world at large. I think Dr. Williams was a considerable national leader and statesman, largely because when he came, he brought political enlightenment to the people and public education, like all the great nationalist statesmen, statesmen of, of the post-war period. I think that this country has lost a great person. There is much which this country has to be grateful for. However, the country must go on, and I believe that I would like to appeal to everyone for peace and unity at this stage. Williams has died in a blaze of glory. The glory of having liberated an entire people from the shackles of colonialism and introducing them to an era of Republican Trinidad where they have enjoyed a sense of dignity, a sense of pride, a sense of belonging hitherto unknown. Dr. William's passing is, is the end of an era in Caribbean politics. I mean, he, he is the last of the great leaders of the Caribbean who brought our countries to independence. Born September 25th, 1911, 2011 marks the centenary of the birth of Dr. Eric Eustace Williams. The longest serving head of government in the Commonwealth Caribbean Eric Williams emerged as a political leader and ushered in a new era in Caribbean political history. Williams fought against colonial rule for the independence of Trinidad and Tobago and led the nation for a quarter of a century. The first of 12 children, he was the son of Thomas and Eliza Williams. A renowned scholar, Williams' first major academic achievement was winning the coveted college exhibition to gain a secondary school education at Queen's Royal College. Later, he won the Island Scholarship and left for Oxford, where he attained first-class honors in history, followed by a doctorate in philosophy. In 1939, he left England to work at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he spent 16 years teaching and studying West Indian history and West Indian affairs. Williams was also associated with the Anglo-American Caribbean Commission until 1955, when his contract was not renewed. Perceiving this as discrimination, he engaged in open conflict with the colonial rulers. A turning point in his career, this set the stage for the integral role he played in founding the first effective political party in Trinidad and Tobago. I don't think that Dr. Williams' original calling was politics. I think he would have preferred, and he said it in one of his uh, lectures time that he would have preferred to pursue his academic career and there's no doubt in my mind that Williams entry into politics was by accident rather than design uh, from my experience my observations he would have preferred in 1955 when his contract would not be new to, to have it renewed and become the first Caribbean chairman of the Caribbean Commission. There's a lot of contradictory evidence as to how and why Williams got into politics. The conventional view is that he was 
mistreated as a colonial at the Caribbean Commission, that he was fired from the Commission, came out, met with some people, um, delivered a brilliant speech, my relations with the Caribbean Commission, saw the reaction and decided, hey fellas, um, you know, I am seen in a particular way, let's, um, let's take advantage of it. I think the reality is more complex. Uh, if we look at Williams's autobiography, not the published one, the unpublished one, you see clear evidence in there that he always intended to get into politics and that the speech that he eventually gave and the biography was part of that project. Uh, so I think the firing at the commission probably affected the timing and the circumstances of his entry into politics. The launch of the People's National Movement in January 1956 resulted in a quiet revolution without bloodshed that transcended the boundaries of race and class. Williams and the PNM won their first mandate in 1956, and under his stewardship and beyond, the party never lost an election for three decades. Committed to regionalism from 1958 to 1962, Dr. Eric Williams was a leading figure in efforts to establish a federation of the West Indies. It is perhaps fashionable in some quarters to blame Williams for the collapse of the Federation. We know the Federation collapsed, but a lot of people and a lot of events contributed to it. Williams certainly did, Manley did, Adams did. A lot of them were screaming their heads off you know, across the Caribbean, making all kinds of statements. It may well be that even though subjectively we were thinking that uh, Federation was a good thing, that in fact uh, the Caribbean was still very insular and we, and we still are so in a way maybe Federation came before its time or maybe it is something that sh would not happen. The first chief minister and the first premier after the short-lived Federation he championed the cause for independence. Armed with a new constitution Dr. Eric Williams and opposition leader Dr. Rudranath Kapaldeo formed a delegation and went to London. It's a great honor for us, the members of the Trinidad and Tobago delegation, to be here this morning in this historic building, taking our place long overdue in the independence queue. The steady progress to full internal self-government in the last few years has enabled the government to raise the standard of living of the people of Trinidad and Tobago to a level higher than that of many independent countries in the contemporary world. The improvement of the material foundations of our society is a necessary safeguard for the preservation and entrenchment of our emerging democracy. This will entail adjustments, economic and psychological, for Trinidad and Tobago in its relations with its West Indian neighbors to the rapidly changing world economy. The independence constitution of Trinidad and Tobago must therefore endow the government, which represents the general will of the people, with sufficient powers to sustain the responsibilities of independence, to guarantee continued investment from all sources, and to ensure the continued improvement of the well-being of the people. When Trinidad and Tobago gained independence on August 31st, 1962, Williams became the first prime minister. May it please your Royal Highness, it is with a feeling of deep pride, pleasure and satisfaction as Prime Minister of the newly independent state of Trinidad and Tobago that I offer you for transmission to Her Majesty the Queen the profound thanks and appreciation of the government, parliament and people of this country for Her Majesty's gracious message. We have looked forward with considerable pleasure to our entry into the Commonwealth family. Now that this goal has been achieved, I ask you to convey to Her Majesty an expression of our unfailing loyalty and devotion to her throne and person. We have been inspired by her good wishes 
and we pledge ourselves to fulfill the promise expected of us, not only by Her Majesty, but by all the nations of the world, to show how our small community, with its people drawn from many lands of diverse racial origins and subscribing to a variety of religious beliefs, can, in harmonious cooperation, make its contribution to the sum total of world peace, world progress, and world happiness. From 1968 to 1970, as the Black Power Movement gained momentum, Williams faced his biggest challenge. The 1970 event has to be seen in its, its national, regional, and international context. It was certainly part of a worldwide movement of students, starting in Berkeley, California, in Paris, in New York, in Ithaca, where I was a student. It was a revolt of a generation who had looked forward to independence and who had felt that all of the things that they dreamt about, all of the things that they assumed would be achieved, uh, it was just not happening and that the older generation had sold us out. I am told by some people who have, who have seen the files that Williams consorted with some of the elements of 1970 uh, and encouraged them to do certain things which would allow him to, to speak in a different way, a different tone to some of the conservative elements in the country. There is some evidence of that. And uh, in fact, he said that if black power means A, B, C, and D, he's, he, he's the biggest black power in town. You know, he said it. He said, I am the big black power in town, you know. But if it means Molotov cocktails, etc., etc., I am not in that. But in terms of the expectations and aspirations of the youth, uh, he was all for black power. When stability was restored, Williams announced a cabinet reshuffle and the establishment of a Ministry of National Security. The emphasis in my present reorganization is on new men and the new ideas they can offer. They have been drafted by me into national service. I have refused to recognize any commitment as superior to the commitment to the nation. Two of the persons so drafted are civil servants. The Ministry of Home Affairs is replaced by a new Ministry of National Security under the Prime Minister. After overcoming the 1970 crisis, in 1973, at the PNM's 15th annual convention, a disillusioned Williams announced his retirement from politics. He agreed to stay on until a new constitution was established. person he was, when you did something that he, he didn't um, particularly like, he took offense. And before I became Governor General, when I was Attorney General, I wrote a particular opinion that he didn't like. And he was frosty for about a month or more. But eventually, I think he was persuaded that he should approach the matter differently, and that was resolved. I don't think I had any of those problems with him as Governor General. Uh, I often listened carefully to what he had to say. I didn't commit myself to approval of it, nor did I express disapproval. But at some later stage, I might raise the matter with him and indicate that I thought the advice I'd given him, which I had not, of course, given him at all, but I couldn't tell him that what he was saying was wrong. So I said, well, you know, the advice I've given you on this matter, I, I think is wrong. I think you should follow a different course. And he would readily accept that. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't rub home to him, you see, that he was wrong. Now, of course, it was he who was wrong. Why fuss about a thing like that? You want results. You don't want personal gratification. So you must know how to deal with the prime minister.
Ireland's spirits were lifted when Hazley Crawford returned home with an Olympic gold medal. It almost looks like the entire population of Trinidad and Tobago have come out here tonight to pay tribute to our great Trinidad hero, Mr. Hazley Crawford. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity of meeting an astronaut who was about the place promoting the United States of America. Trinidad and Tobago can't send an astronaut to promote. We could send a man that no astronaut can catch because he can't go back. Later that year, Williams fulfilled his goal of a new constitution and led the move to republicanism. By 70, the, the monarchy was a bad word, okay? Nobody was going to propose the continuation of that arrangement after all that had happened in 1970. The population was ready for it. In fact, it never even became an issue. You know, um, the Wooden Commission, of which I was a member, recommended it. And Williams changed a lot from that, from what we had proposed, but nobody, it, I don't think very many people even assumed that um, there was a debate about Republican status. It was automatic, more or less automatic. The pe people were prepared for it, mentally and politically. On August 31st, 1976, in an interview with the media, Williams spoke candidly on the changes associated with becoming a republic and expressed a strong view about coalition governments. The coalition thing is something that you, in order to get somebody's support in the parliament, he said, well, I have three seats in the parliament, I join you, etc. Provided you give me a particular ministry, what would you do to man after the Ministry of Finance? <laughs> and you go back to another election. What would you do if you asked for the ministry in charge of uh, law and order? Oh, no. With the change in economic fortunes in the mid-70s, Williams became optimistic again. The oil boom, as it was popularly called, enabled him to widen the economic base of Trinidad and Tobago. Developing new energy-based industries, Williams established the Point Lisas Industrial Estate, a centerpiece which he hoped would become one of the largest energy-based complexes in Latin America and the Caribbean. The Minister of Petroleum and Mines has referred to the agreement which Fortran has structured with Amapo. He has also indicated to me that ISCOS will be submitting within the next few weeks its own proposal for marketing of its production. Underlying all of these arrangements and agreements is the fact of life, namely, that Trinidad and Tobago will have to seek export markets in the international community for the production that will come from these plants here at Point Lisa. The government is a matter of policy and as exemplified in its sources of finance, in its sources of technology, and in its sources of raw materials, when these are necessary, has taken a decision to diversify wherever feasible in its marketing arrangements. Williams also made his mark with social and economic programs and a thrust in educational development. We wanted to make sure that no child who had talent would fall by the wayside. You know, you had to give them the opportunities. And those opportunities, so it was free secondary education. But, but and I remember him telling us, but the children may not be able to study because they haven't eaten. Hence the school meals. That's how the school feeding program came in. Um, so the children could eat, could benefit from the education because they were well-fed kind of thing, you know? So there was a lot of that kind of attention to this, not just the end product, but how you get there that was so important um, that is critical for any success. Throughout his political career, Dr. Eric Williams was mindful of the role of women in national development teaching at school one day and I got a call from the principal comes to the office and the splash woman says that I'm wanted by Mr. Privat immediately up at Cascade at his home 
And I said, well, let me finish my class. And he says, no, 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 immediately, Mr. Speedy, Mrs. Gordon, immediately. So I left and I went to Mr. Privat, who told me that Dr. Williams wanted to make me um, a parliamentary secretary, and therefore I need to be a senator. And I would need to be sworn in that afternoon. I am talking about 10 o'clock in the morning. The swearing in is 5 o'clock in the afternoon at the president's house. And I needed to get some documents for them. And I got the, I was supposed to get the documents of them at 1 o'clock. So at about 3 minutes to 1, I am literally running with the documents. And I get to the front door and I knock and knock. And the door and he says, with a big smile, he says, come in. And I come in with the envelope. And he looks at Boise Privat and he says, pay me. So I'm looking at both of them and saying, well, now what is this about? And I said, excuse me? And he said, yes. I bet him that you would be the only person who would beat the deadline. And I won. So he took his $20 from Boise Privat. So that's how I met Dr. That was my first meeting with Dr. Williams, this man, taking a bet on my head and collected. <laughs> it was funny. By the late 70s, Williams became inexplicably withdrawn. Towards the end of his uh, career, I saw very little of him. There was no enmity, there was no adverse relationship. It was simply that for one reason or another, he ceased to come. He always sent messages saying that he would, until the messengers, who were either Johnny O'Halloran or Errol Mahabir, got fed up of coming to tell me that the Prime Minister is going to come to me soon and find out that he didn't. So I lived with it. The signs had begun to surface of either, in my view again, a person who had become let me put it this way, less and less interested in both party and to some extent government. A person who was showing signs of, I don't suppose the better term may be frustration or that he was not achieving the objectives or there was a, there was a marked difference in terms of his personality, his, his activities, his utterances that one could have picked up. I think towards the end of Dr. Williams's 25 years as leader, from 1956 to 1981 when he died, um, I think he was very, I think, disillusioned. And um, when he said sometime around 1980, he's in a back seat in the car. <laughs> and, and I became a little bit also disappointed in him because I wasn't getting any leadership from him anymore. And I, I became almost angry with him. Until I understood that he was, he was just, he needed help. He needed help, he needed somebody to, to really hold his hand and, um, and, and, and pick him up and so on. Often described as an enigma, Dr. Eric Williams is remembered fondly by those who worked closely with him. A genuine father who gave you all the opportunities, who wasn't, who would not shook from um, a breed in you if you didn't make it. Um, but if you were trying, he recognized that. Um, a visionary that we will, I don't think we'll see the likes of for a long, long time. A man devoted to making sure that every person in Trinidad and Tobago have the opportunity available to them to make it. In my view, or what I know of him, he was very simple. Contrary to attempts to mystify him, Dr. Williams was a normal human being, very articulate, very intelligent, very analytical. And I don't think he was ever attracted from my experience with him to the finer things in life. He lived a very simple life. The last note that I wrote to him was on the Friday before he died on Sunday. I had written a note to him saying, Dear Bill, 
I promised Ermintrude a shopping trip to Miami. As everything seems quiet, I propose to go on a week from that date. If there isn't anything that you think important, uh, I'll be leaving so and so. I sent that to his home on Friday after lunch. I don't know if he ever read it, and he died on the Sunday. To the people of Trinidad and Tobago, he is the father of the nation. We will have to say that Williams was the father of the nation. It does not mean that he was the person, he was the only person who made significant contributions. That would not be true. But if I had to single out one person uh, who perhaps contributed the most to the shaping of whatever Trinidad and Tobago became or has become, I would have to say that he was that person. Under the leadership of Dr. Williams, Trinidad and Tobago was transformed from a struggling colony to an independent and a prosperous nation. On March 29, 1981, the nation mourned Dr. Williams' death. As his body lay in state in the rotunda of the Red House, an estimated 200,000 persons filed past to pay their last respects. Today, Dr. Eric Eustace Williams is remembered as a scholar, politician, and international statesman. <laughs>